Oh, Jeff is our yeah, and Jeff is our official spokesperson yes, yes. for many years, yes. and um, and also Paul. Yeah. Paul Callahan, please buy his book. Please, please, please. He's singing a relative accordance of a yeah. tall, the yeah. tall man. <laughs> and if you wanted to say a few words, and would you want to say anything else? No. <laughs> and we should also say um, that we I, I, I want to hear this. I want to hear this next week at the Parliament House, and then you're right. It's going to go out. All right, you can do it. I want swear or something. Yeah, I one more thing. Um, Dr. McAsher is here, and he's the one that paid um, uh, money for the uh, painting, the, the Aboriginal Diggers painting. And uh, it's now in Redfern, and it was the first one that was actually bought um, to be part of a collection that's for the public, you know. It was from the Keeping Place too, and we want to thank him for his support all, all these years, Dr. McAsher. He was the first GP that um, took care of Mum Cheryl when the Aboriginal Medical Service, she had so many kids that they all struggled, and McAsher was wonderful. That's in the language of my people, the Warramai people, the Gadang language of Port Stephens fellas. Me paying my respects to this beautiful country and to the, the people of this country, my spirit ancestors who I know are here with us today and to my elders past and present and people here today. And I couldn't help but driving in here thinking what this place would look like 300 years ago, and it would have been beautiful. Big thank you to Gordon and Elaine for allowing me to come here today and, and pedal my book. And in terms of the book, just in five minutes so people get a bit of an understanding of where I'm coming from, my passion in life is learning, and I love nothing better than listening and learning from my elders. And an old woman once said to me, she said, Paul, she said, how come all these white fellas, John Howard, all these other fellas say, you black fellas, you just got to forget about the past and you're just going to move on. Just muscle up and move on. And she said, all I have is my past. I have nothing else but my past and my story. My story is who I am. And for each of you, you all came in here today and all you brought in here was your past. But every one of you has a magnificent story. It'll have sad bits, it'll have triumphs, it'll have great bits. And it's important that you share your story and with Uncle Gordon, what I see here today is a wonderful way to share story and to enable our people to share the story of their past and to embrace their past. And that old woman said to me, she said, my past is all I own. And before I can go into the future that all these white fellows want me to do, I need to heal and I can only heal until the things in my past are made good and made well. And so, in thinking about that, what it is, is we can't change our past, but we need to address our past. And that's what she said. She said, my past, I need to address that, and I need to come to terms with that. And so, with Uncle Gordon's painting, that shows a, a past that our communities and our people need to have understood and supported, because our stories need to be understood and supported, all of us. And something I share in the workshops I provide these days is from talking to Aboriginal people, the word UNITE is an acronym I've put together, and UNITE stands for understand not understanding, not ignorance, tokenism or expedience. And everywhere I go, because we're driven by the clock and we're driven, driven by being expedient, we see tokenistic actions and we see ignorance. Because to really understand someone, you need to take the time to understand their story. And that's the way to heal. So, the book that I've created, it started as a passion because my story is a privileged one. As I grew up at Cruel Mission, I went through life and by the time I was 34, I had a diploma in surveying, a diploma in drafting and a Bachelor of Commerce in Accounting, Marketing and Economics. I had a lovely wife who's still stuck by me despite me being tall and ugly. Uh, when I was 34, I had three kids, two, two kids and one other way. Two cars and two jobs in a house. So, as a black fella out of the educational system, I was the bee's knees. I'm the one that everyone would say in the educational system, we want more of him. 
But on the day of my 35th birthday, I collapsed with a nervous breakdown. And for months, I lay in the bed curled up in a fetal position with my poor wife, Alison, looking at me and wanting to help me, not knowing what to do. With three young kids by that stage, and all I could do was cry and say, I'm sorry. I had all the qualifications in the world. I had a job and I had a house. And all the government policies I see these days, what do they say us black fellas need? A house, jobs and employment. And that's true. But what I was missing was self-esteem and me and my identity. And that was because of my turbulent journey and the things that had come to me because I, I'm an Aboriginal person in terms of transgenerational trauma. So as I healed myself and I embraced modern mental health practitioners and it was fantastic. I also explored through books, Hinduism and Buddhism and all sorts of things, Christianity, and they gave me gems as well. And as I rebuilt, I learned that I'd spent my life trying to be all things to all people at all times because I didn't like myself, because I had no self-esteem, because I grew up as a little black fellow in a mission with no shoes and was ostracised by my own mob because I liked learning and I was ostracised by white fellows because I was a dirty black woman. And so I had a choice as I healed to either own my life and walk my footsteps or to stay down there as a victim. And as I walked my footsteps and started to find my path, the breakdown became a breakthrough because I learned that I can be me, I can be strong and I can walk my footsteps. And no longer do I have to walk the footsteps of everyone else's expectations. I no longer have to be the perfect uh, boss, employee, community member and friend. I can just be me and in doing that I can share love. And on that journey, a man named Paul Gordon, who contributed to this book, met me and I'd heard stories about this Paul Gordon. They said, oh yeah, he takes father's bush, go, keep away from him, he's a bad man. He'll steal things, he's a cultist, they do nasty things up there. And 15 years later, all I've seen is love and sharing and knowledge. And it's the kind of knowledge that should sit there with Buddhism and Christianity and Hinduism and all the other stuff. It should be there in that world library of knowledge. And so I asked him a couple of years ago, do you mind if I share your words because your words are beautiful and they inspire and they can save a lot of lives, not just within Australia, throughout the world. And he said, yeah, but I don't mind that. So I put it in there and then as I started to put his words down and started to do the narrative, I found that my journey, my privileged journey through depression, and through learning and through culture is also something there to be shared because after I rebuilt myself, I, I, I ended up in the TAFE system and I became the first Aboriginal Institute Director in the history of TAFE New South Wales for five years at New England Institute, where I had 23,000 students, 1,200 staff across 110,000 kilometres with 11 campuses with a $70 million budget. And in 2011, we finished the best institute in New South Wales and top three in Australia. And so it shows you don't have to believe the labels of mental stigma of you're permanently broken, that you can't heal, that you can't go forward, that you can't do this and you can't do that. And so in putting that all together, the book has messages, it has narratives, it has beautiful quotes from not just Uncle Paul, Uncle Paul is the repository of thousands of years of old people handing out knowledge. And so the book has all of that in it. It's my attempt to share our knowledge and wisdom with the world because the trauma we see in Australia can't be fixed, I believe, with the systems that embed themselves and create barriers within Australia. We need a whole world order to understand the beauty of our culture. And through that, we'll create a coalition of the willing throughout the world that will be attracted to us and start building on the momentum that Uncle Gordon has pulled together and my brothers to the left of me have pulled together. And in doing that, my last comment is, my story is my story, it is my truth. And so there are people who will pick me off and say, how dare you write about that stuff? I'll say, well, this is my story. But you're entitled to your story as well, and I'll respect your story. Because in this book, I don't try and say I'm the cultural wizard and that I know what happens in any particular country. This is my knowledge that I'd like to share to hopefully inspire people to explore their country and to go and talk to those old fellows in their country and find their truth and then build that culture up in all of their regions so that we have an orchestra of culture coming throughout Australia where we unite, as my brother and I talked about earlier today. So thank you, Uncle, for the invite. I've spoken enough, and yes, please buy plenty of books. I've got more in the car. <laughs>
really lovely to have you here to share in this celebration. I'd just like to remind you of just a few housekeeping things. Um, contact Jordan, myself and Terry before you leave. If you know anyone who would like to acquire a Gordon Siren, they're only here today and tomorrow and um, they're at a bargain prices. So you won't, you won't get a Gordon Siren for, um, for any, any lower than you would get today. So get one in your collection and come and see us. It's so exciting, so let's again share and be a grand applause to everyone for being here. I'd like to thank the curator, Saha and Jordan and Terry, Terry um, Hackford. And there's so many people here I'd like to acknowledge, like Bibi Barber, who held the last exhibition for us and sponsored the whole thing, um, Kira Billy Dreaming for Gordon, and Robin Straub, who stores our containers for us, <laughs> lovely lady over there, and Alex Gaffigan, who is from the Maritime Museum, making us website. And we've even got next door neighbors here. <laughs> Thank you for coming along, Miss and Margaret. And um, Karen. Um, Susanna Bradshaw um, is the head of the foundation of National Parks and Wildlife, and she's, come here. She just oh, wrote, wrote the um, inside for us, and I'd like to thank her, and I'd like to thank Mel and Daz for, um, Mel and Daz for organizing everything. <laughs> There's the rangers here. I just thank you. I'd just like to add as well, um, let's thank Elaine and Gordon. Yes. It's been a great There's wine here, kindly donated by Easel Wines. Um, there's a nice little story in the back about the artist red wine, water, tea, and coffee, and that's all we know for the week. Thank you so much. Thank you.